Zoom hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great. I don't know where the camp, the mic is, but it doesn't matter if it works. It is our great pleasure to introduce you all to our first speaker of the semester, Dr. Ting Lee. Um, Ting, as you all are aware, because if you don't know Ting, you read my email, so you are aware of her, of her history in the department. Uh, she was part of the, she and along with Ryan, um, we're part of the first group of graduate students to be admitted into our then new astronomy program in 2010. Is that when you started? Yeah. And graduated in 2016. They're the first group of students that got PhDs in astronomy at Texas A&M. Um, she did really excellent work in the lab and as an observational astronomer when she was here that allowed her to go on and do even greater things. Um, since she's left in the past six years. So she went from here to Fermilab as the SRAM fellow, is that right? The Letterman Fellow. Letterman Fellow, I'm sorry. One of the fellows at Fermilab. Um, and she continued her involvement in the Dark Energy Survey. And then while she was there, she also started up this uh, S5 project that she's going to talk to us about today and did a whole bunch of other things that I encourage you to talk to her about. Um, it's large and small instruments, but mostly observational astronomy science leadership projects, I would say. Um, and uh, after three years at Fermilab, she virtually in the pandemic moved, mostly virtually, uh, moved on to a uh, Einstein fellowship at Carnegie Observatories. Um, and you had some other joint- Carnegie Princeton. Carnegie Princeton fellow. She had all the fellowships that year. Uh, you combined them all and she was at Carnegie for a couple of years before she uh, took a faculty job at University of Toronto, which is where she is now. So we are very happy to have you here. Um, I really encourage, so she'll be here today and tomorrow and part of Wednesday. I really encourage the graduate students to meet with her, not just during your 30 minutes or whatever that you have. There's a lot of things that you can learn from this lady. And she is this professor, I shouldn't call you a lady, she's your professor. And uh, uh, anything else? All right, take it away, Ting. We're so happy to have you back. Oh, and Ting, I'm sorry. I'm going to say one more thing, which is I have to leave to teach my class at 12:30, so you can monitor your own questions if you walk past that. Okay, <laughs> don't be offended when I get up and walk out. <laughs> but anyway, thanks a lot, and thanks for the nice introduction, Jen, and thanks so much for having me here. It was a great pleasure to come back. I think. I was here once in 2017, but yeah, I haven't been here for five years. So a lot of new faces, especially the, the student here. And I'm very happy to talk to you. So feel free to reach out to me. I think there's a schedule that whenever you are seeing empty, just feel free to reach out to me. I'm probably just walking around in this building or in the visit office. So today, as what Jim mentioned, I'm gonna talk about this program that I'm leading running in the past three, four years. It's called the Southern Stellar Stream Spectroscopic Survey. And I'm talking about a bit of overview and the latest science result. I do want to say that I also work on a lot of other things. So a lot won't be covered here. You're welcome to talk to me offline. But at the, for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to focus on this program. So what you're seeing here is, I think, a background is a Gaia flux map. And the individual color dots here are the individual member stars from the stellar streams uh, that we have observed from this program. And then I'm going to show some of the results from this. So to start with, for people here, what is stellar stream? So if you very brief, so the Milky Way or any other galaxies have a lot of surrounding satellites, either as dwarf galaxies or globular clusters. Those systems orbiting around the Milky Way, but some of them, when they are getting very close, to the Milky Way because of the gravitational potential, they got torn apart and forming these kind of ribbon like structure, linear structure on the sky. So this is a simulation showing from my collaborator, Dennis Oker, showing like 10 globular cluster like system falling in and how they disrupted. So color coded in green. And you also see like the, 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 the red points are just a dark matter distribution. So a lot of these stellar stream has been discovered over the past decade or two thanks to all these imaging surveys, some of those I'm also involved in. So this is the northern part of the northern sky. 
this very famous image from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, one of the data release. So what you are seeing here is a density distribution of the stars color coded in distance. So you see different color because they are at different distance. So you can see these kind of structure coming out like very famous Sagittarius streams so come from the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy. And this is one of the very famous global cluster stream, Palma 5 is a global cluster and has tidal tails. There's also this famous GD1 stream and the Alpha stream. So you see these kind of over densities on the sky form these kind of linear structure. And that's the uh, uh, stellar streams that we are talking about here. In the southern sky recently, um, thanks to the dark energy survey, so People here actually work on that in this way from commissioning the instrument to do the science. I'm also involved in those. In 2018, we published this work that, first of all, this is the footprint of the dark energy survey. As you will see, it's like a tank shape. Although it was not designed on purpose, but it ended up with this kind of tank shape. Again, it's a density of individual stars in our Milky Way at different distance, color coded different distance. So this is the outskirt of the LMC. So you see that's a bit far away. And that's part of the Sagittarius stream, around something like 20 kiloprocess. You can see a few narrow streams here, like one of these here, one of them here, and here. So you see these kind of linear structures. These are the part of the southern hemisphere for the streams. And as the Gaia turned on, and from, I think, uh, GR2 in 2018, a few dozens of new streams were discovered from just measuring the stars moving together in proper motion space. So this is a map of all the streams that between three to 12 kiloparsec. So really it's like a spaghetti word of, of all these streams that in our Milky Way, as the dozens of them have been found. So yeah, there's a lot of these discoveries either from, um, Geometry survey or from like astrometry survey from Gaia. But why these are interesting? So I'm going to elaborate a bit on the science that we stellar stream. So I'm going to touch three parts. One is the formation of the Milky Way stellar hail the, um, to constrain the mass of the Milky Way and the potential shape of the Milky Way, and also how we can use that to constrain the dark matter by measuring the dark matter subgenome mass function. For each of the seven categories, I'm going to propose a few questions that we're trying to answer in that part. So the first on the formation of Milky Way stellar halo. So we know that the, ga the galaxy are formed periodically. So the question like for our own Milky Way, we want to know questions such as, uh, one want to answer to these questions such as, what are the building blocks of our Milky Way? What do the most massive pool start coming from? It coming from several dwarf, most massive dwarf galaxy or come from a lot of the small building blocks. And I don't think we know that answer yet. And then the next one uh, about the Milky Way mass and potential, the question we can ask is whether the Milky Way spheral mass is 0.8 or 1.6 10 to the 10, uh, times 10 to the 12 solar mass. You see, oh, this is a, back, a, a fact of two, but yes, we actually don't know that number very well, even for the galaxy we are residing in. This is a paper published in 2019. Actually, there's probably a new one now but we're showing you with different method, with different tracer people trying to constrain the mass of Milky Way. And so the smallest mass people getting is something like 0 0.6, 0 0.5, and the largest one is like two to three. So we know that, uh, we don't know our Milky Way's mass, the total mass by a factor of more than two, depending on what method you use, depending on what tracer you use. And also another question we want to know is whether the potential of the Milky Way is spherical or triaxial. There's a bit of tension because that Sagittarius comes in, because LMC comes in, that a lot of these perturbers, when we try to measure the Milky Way's potential, there's got a lot of difficulties. In the last part, I probably will spend a bit more time on is something I'm most interested in, but also interested in other ones, is to uh, try to use the the streams to measure the dark matter subhalo mass function. So why that is important? The question that's connected to those is, is dark matter cold or warm or self-interacting? We don't really know the property of dark matter, although we discovered it uh, almost to 70 or even more, I know, almost like, a, uh, yeah, 90 years ago now, I think, depending on how we start counting that. And uh, also the question is, can we find dark matter subhalos but below 10 to the seven solar mass. So this is something connect to the different number of subhalos that different dark matter predicts. So this is just one of the examples showing you the cold dark matter on the left and the, uh, the warm dark matter uh, model on the right. So these are the, the distribution of the galaxies or subhalos uh, in a Milky Way-like host. So the cold dark matter, uh, cold dark matter model 
there way more subhalos than the warm dark matter halo. And the reason it's important is that we believe that uh, under certain threshold, like 10 to the 7, those dark matter halo does not form star anymore because they are not massive enough to attract enough gas to trigger star formation. So we want to be able to find these subhalos by just finding the galaxy. We have to find other ways to do this, and that's something stream can help. Oh, by the way, feel free to interrupt me anytime if you have any questions. I try to put a few background here for people who do not work on this field, but I want to make sure you get it before we move on to all the cool size. So what you are seeing here is two stellar stream run model. One on the top won't have any subhalo interaction. The bottom one you will see that has uh, like two dark matter subhalo coming and interact. Those can be just totally dark. It doesn't have to have galaxies of the stars forming there. And because just the gravitational interaction by some massive thing um, like pass through the stream, you will see these kind of density variations or gaps in these streams. So by identifying these kind of features, hopefully we will be able to reconstruct the mass function of the real Curly subhalo. And these things can be completely dark and we won't be able to see them if without doing this kinematic or dynamic. So there is some kind of study on this already. And one example, very famous example is the GD1 stream. So on the top is from a, a combination of hand star photometry with Gaia uh, proper motion astrometry that um, led by uh, Bernata um, et al. So these are the actual stars observed in the GD1. And in this work, she tried to model a perturbable GD1 with different parameters, like how fast the perturber is when it passes through the stream, how massive the perturber is, how big the perturber is. So he used all the, she used all of those, those different models uh, to the parameters to fit, and that's the reconstruct model. So you can see they are not identical, but very similar to have these kind of spur feature and these kind of gap feature. And with this last model is the range of the parameters showing the mass versus the size of the perturber. So that's the shaded region showing where the mass model is. And uh, this shaded region, vertical band, is telling us like what is what we expected based on the Lambda CDM model for cold dark matter. So you see there is some tension, um, that, that tension here or this disagreement here, but this is just with one particular stream with one particular example. But then well, the question really is whether it's really coming from this kind of subhale perturber or it's from something different. Or if it is, then how many of those we expect to find in this break the actual Lambda CD model? So that's kind of one example showing you that how stream can be used to do this kind of study. Okay, yeah, so with all these actual science that we can do, we wanted to study more stellar streams and try to answer one or many of these questions. So that's where I started at this stage at 2018 when the dark energy survey started all these, finally discovered all these great uh, results about, I think we find more than a dozen of stellar streams in the footprint. You cannot see all of them here, but they are there. It's just a construction issue. So before I move on, any questions about the background part? If not, okay, so that's the stage where I'm at in 2018 when I was a postdoc at Fermi Lab, uh, I think third, second year. And so this is where the where the where the thing kicks in. So we have commentary from Doc Andrew for all those amazing discoveries for the stellar stream. So we use the, the that time the public data release of the dark energy spec to serve as the photometry selection. And the same year that Gaia GR2 came out to give all the proper motions. So putting them together and uh, find that the best instrument for this kind of science, uh, which is a four meter telescope, uh, a 3.9 telescope in Australia, that is a unique ability of within, uh, with uh, uh, 400 fibers over a two degree field of view. That means that you can observe 400 stars or targets at one time over a field of view two degree in diameter and feed it to a, a dual arm spectrogram. So we started this survey called the Southern Stellar Stream Spectroscopic Survey, or S5. At the same time that uh, we have access to the larger telescopes, so for the member stars that were identified with the medium, low to medium resolution spectrograph from A Omega, and from this uh, program, we will feed them one at a time to a single object spectrograph, the mic spectrograph, on um, uh, um, Magellan, and then to study the abundances 
but the residual chemical abundance is in this, those stellar stream. So you can think of like uh, the S5 is com uh, as composed of using the medium to low resolution spectrograph to get the kinematics and the magnetity of the stars, identify the membership of the stars, and then follow up with uh, high resolution, larger telescopes to understand the individual, uh, the, the chemical abundance in these individual stars. And uh, so, so far, uh, we started the first paper in 2019. In the past three years, we had 13 paper. Oops, I go just very quick. I don't have time to go through all of them, but I want to highlight a few results. You can find all of them in our website if you are interested in to follow up later. But so these are the three topics I mentioned earlier in terms of what science we can learn from these streams. And I'm going to one example from our work for each, each of the, 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 the science we, we, we try to study. So for the first one is the, the formation of the Milky Way and the stellar halo. So this is one of the streams that we find very interesting. This stream called the Phoenix stream, again, is discovered in the dark energy survey. And we followed up and identified member stars. And that's the member star that we find the mapless. So this is the histogram. Uh, this is histogram if you use the uh, label on the right side. It's, and on the left side is the signal choice as a function of mapless. So orange stars are the member star we find in the Phoenix stream based on the spread of the, of the the, uh, the velocity and also the measurement error, we conclude that this is a global cluster. It's originated from a global cluster. So it's a global cluster that's entirely apart uh, from the And uh, it has a mean velocity around minus 2.7. And then the other uh, sign of uh, gray kind of histogram here showing are all the global clusters that we know in our Milky Way. So none of them actually are below velocity of minus 2.4. This global cluster stream, that this, this stellar stream that is formed from disrupted global cluster has a velocity much poor, more poor, uh, more metal poor than any of the no global cluster at that time. So that's a pretty cool result that tells us to understand like maybe there are a lot of these kind of low mass uh, metal poor global cluster in our Milky Way, but we have never seen the video. Um, worked like a long time ago, but we still can see them in the form of stellar streams. So that work was published in 2020. And just this year, two years later, it was done by a separate group, though they were also searching for doing some of the stream work in Europe. So this is a stream called C19. And that stream turns out to have a metallicity, mean metallicity of minus 3.4. So that's even more uh, uh, lower, lower uh, uh, city compared to Phoenix. Again, that's a disrupted global cluster. Although the nature, whether it's a global cluster or it's a dwarf galaxy, I think it's due to But that's just another example. That's very cool. Like we are, maybe that will help us to understand all of those extreme metal poor star, ultra metal poor star, like where those come from in our Milky Way halo. Okay, so the second part, so I taught, as I mentioned, we're trying to constrain the mass of the Milky Way. That's something we are still working on, but in order to better measure the mass of our Milky Way or the potential of the Milky Way, we'll find we also need to understand the biggest perturber or the satellite of our Milky Way, which is a large Magellan cloud. And uh, from this work, so we try to constrain the mass of the LMC using five streams and fitting them independently. And that's the joint, the joint result is like a this, this graph line here. So we got something around the Milky Way, uh, the LMC's mass is around 1.5 to 1 1.9 times 10 to the 11 solar mass. In order to get these fit, we also need a lot much lighter Milky Way. So remember I mentioned about the fact of two uh, difference in the mass of the Milky Way. So in order to get all these fit, we also need to have a Milky Way mass to be on the low end. So it's 0 0.8 times 10 to the 12. So originally we thought that the LMC and Milky Way is a 10 to 1 to 10 merger, but actually it's probably more like a 1 to 5 uh, merger based on the based on the mass that we got from this work. This is something we also did. And the next step actually was trying to use all the streams that we have observed and fitting the Milky Way and the LMC globally and then try to understand both the shape and the mass of, of the systems. And then in this panel originally, I was trying to give, uh, showing you that how we can use the, use the streams to study the subhill mass function of the Milky Way and uh, also use that to constrain the, the 
the, the dark matter property. So here I give an example of one of the streams that we followed up in S5. So when we followed up those streams, we thought these two, one is called Alika Uma stream here. One is called an Atlas stream. And don't ask me about how these names come from. I'm happy to talk, but it'll take another hour. I'm happy to tell you about all these naming conventions. But anyway, these are the two streams we followed up. When we followed them, we thought they are two separate streams because you can see that they are not continued on the sky and they also have some distance difference. But then when we measure the velocity of these individual stars, we find them that they seamlessly connect to each other. And uh, this is probably a better way to see this. So what you are seeing is along the, like some angle on the sky, the same as the fire one. So this is, uh, uh, the, you can think of like RA deck, just like spatial distribution of individual stars. And yet the velocity, the proper motion, and these two streams just seamlessly connect each other for individual star we observe. And also there are some distance gradient. This part is farther than that part, but again, there's, there's no gap between the two. So we confirm that these two previous we thought are in the separate stream, but actually it's one stream. So then the question would be, what is causing all of these? So this actually spur gap feature is very similar to GD1, the previous one that I showed, but this one is at three times further compared to the previous GD1 stream, we are at, we are at the Milky Way halo, and we see something like that. So this is another example of these streams have these kind of, uh, these kind of perturbation signature that might come from the dark matter sub halo, or maybe come from Sagittarius. Actually, that's something we found, this might be caused by the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy. But again, this is not as evidence is showing the perturbation from those, from those uh, 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 seed in those uh, in those stellar stream, and we're trying to find more of these, and then hopefully we can do some uh, analysis statistically. Yeah, so it's very similar to this G1 stream that I mentioned earlier in terms of the spur and the gap, except that this is probably half clump a few percent apart. This is something like three times more, so 1.5 to 2 uh, kilos apart. So the, the gap is much bigger. The spur feature is also much bigger because it's farther away. Okay, so that's the work we, the three results that came from the low risk, medium risk part. As I mentioned that for all the member stars were identified from the AT from the low to medium resolution spectrogram. We also feed the brightest member to the, to the mic spectrogram, the high resolution one on Magellan and try to study the abundance. I'm gonna show two examples here, what we learned from those data. Uh, there's some question on the, in the chat. Yeah, I was going to say, so we have, uh, Casey, do you want to just ask your question? Now, uh, yeah, sure. I'm happy to. So I'm saying I'm, I'm loving this. I came in late. Um, I, I was just struck by the low metallicities of the stars in the stream. You had the, you know, they're always less than kind of the distribution of Milky Way stars. Uh, do you, did you, have it, did you, do you, do you have anything to comment on about the chemical enrichment history of these? I mean, how many, Quark Club Supernova did the experience. One, I always felt like, you know, minus 2.5 is like where one supernova you can enrich up to. So I'm just curious what you thought. Yeah, probably just one general, one, one or two kind of, it should be very, very low. And uh, because the fact we don't see any metallicity spread there, I think it was all from like the formation. So it doesn't have an extended star formation history either. But, oh, that's a good point. Yeah, it's, right. it's okay. So, so it's. I don't think they are. These probably are. Well, none of these are pop three stars. First of all, but uh, they are definitely formed a very long time ago. And one thing I, if I have time later on, I will mention like these particular stream. They have a eccentricity of something like 0.2, so almost circular orbit. That might explain also like a form a long time ago, but have a long surviving time. That's why you can see it nowadays. So it should be, I mean, we don't have a measurement of the age, but it should form a long time ago, very old, and uh, have maybe one or two supernova explosion. Uh, oh, well, okay, I have to say, because it's a global class stream, so it's formed around a, galaxy somewhere like now probably it's fully mixed right so and the and the, and i actually don't know what the host galaxies uh, uh mass would be or mass would be so so but it is it should be something formed in another external galaxy like many years many giga years ago and then for in with the for into the milky way 
uh, a long time ago and survived uh, for a long time and get disrupted and we still can see it nowadays. That's what I my guess how it formed. Although I have to be cautious, I think we don't see the malice uh, spread, but doesn't hundred percent say it is not a galaxy. I think at that mass and that malicity regime, we really don't know much about the difference between galaxy and cluster. And that's another topic that I can give another talk maybe several years later. We we'll have some work on that right now. But I'm not sure if I answer your question. I think it's- No, but you did. You, you... I can I ask one follow up real quick? Um, do you have any other metallicity measurements or is it just iron? Any other elemental abundance measurements, really? Where you interrupt me is the next work on this stream, actually. Is that I will show some results okay. there, although I probably won't touch that to your question. But this work is done with only the medium resolution data, so it only has iron. And the result has come from iron, but it's confirmed from the high resolution follow up. And there are some abundances there. And I would encourage everyone to talk to Jen because she is here. She's involved in all of these and know probably better than me in the high risk part. And uh, there's a lot of results come out. I will illustrate one or two here, but uh, there are more stuff that you will come to talk to Jen and learn from, from her work. And Caitlin? Yeah, Caitlin, who is actually working part of on this stuff if you wanted to know more. But I do wanted to say is I talked to a few people doing simulations. They did say like minus 2.7 is not absolutely not possible. They have some scattering there. Minus 3.4, um, maybe that's not a uh, cluster or maybe the whole cluster. It's like, if you find one, I think they always can say it's outlier. If you find more like a dozen, then they will say their whole model is wrong and they need some challenge, yeah. And we are finding more of these. Wait for a few months to see the result. Anyway, um, Annie, do you do you want to go too? Uh, yeah, if you don't mind, I have a I have a question as well about the same things that Casey was asking about. Sure, go ahead. Um, so if you go back to the slide showing the histogram with the metallicities, yeah. So I'm curious if you were to also put on this histogram. Uh, metallicities of just globular cluster streams, do they also skew uh, oh. more metal poor? And does that mean you know, a, something about which ones are more, I guess, preferentially or, easy, or more easily tidally disrupted completely? You know, like it's at the lower mass globular clusters or something like that? Very good question. And I have to say, I delete that slide because I feel like <laughs> I'll go over everything. But uh, let me see if I can find another talk. And this is actually part I will mention later on. The answer up to that point that the answer to this question, your question is, yeah, is you don't know because nobody else other than my group before that actually know anything about the streams velocity, global cost stream velocity. Like maybe the only one we know is GD1 stream, that's it. And uh, we don't know the answer. But uh, as I mentioned, as a half, second and a half of my talk, time, we're going to talk about uh, the population of streams. And uh, one of the work you see in this slide will kind of answer your question. So what I'm showing here is the malicity versus eccentricity of the, uh, the uh, that mean malicity of the global cost stream versus eccentricity of the, of the global cost stream. The dots here are global clusters that are 10 kiloparsec away, or 10 or more kiloparsec away. For example, more or one, I guess, you know what I mean. And uh, the because I didn't include any of the like the, the, the nearby, the, the galactic same like the, the global clusters that are close to the galactic center. So these are all the ones probably are accreted, not, not, not doesn't have to be, but they are pretty far from the galactic center. And what also you are seeing here is the streams. So these are the six global clusters that I'll mention later that we observe and we have the velocity in their orbits. So this is, I think the two information we are getting from here, one is, out of the six stream has not mostly below minus two. Well, if you look at the global cluster, 90% of the global cluster, even these are all the outer halo global cluster, right? Because they're all beyond 10 kiloparsec from the galaxy center. They are still more metal rich. So they are not at like minus 0.5 or zero, like the very solar velocity one, but they are still more metal rich compared to the disrupted one that we find. So that's one thing we find in this work. The second is there's kind of some correlation here, like the, Lower, the lower the malicity, the circular, the stream, uh, the orbit is, which is something I mentioned to a case earlier. So that may explain why this is the Phoenix stream that I mentioned earlier. This may explain why that you can see it nowadays, because 
our circular orbit can have a longer lifetime, and that's why we still we still can see that now. So that's maybe the correlation. But again, you don't want to confirm uh, uh, like claim a, a correlation with probably six data points. But uh, there are actually more and more streams that we know nowadays we can add to this plot. But that's kind of the thing we are finding. But definitely there is a difference between the intact global cluster and the uh, disrupted global cluster stream. And these six all have no progenitor. So these are not just tidal tails around a known global cluster, which nowadays people see quite a few with Gaia. These are the streams that we don't know the progenitor, which are likely disorbed nowadays. So they are pretty old and formed a long time. Okay, so that's a good jump, and I will probably get to this later in this time. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. That was very interesting. I have more, but I can ask them later. Sure. Let's see if I will have time to get actually my links to this board. But this is this is again the high res part. I just want to touch a little bit to let you guys know we are actually doing the high resolution stuff as well. Uh, and again, if you are interested in more, more, please feel free to talk to me offline or ask Jen or Kate one. So these are going to show two results on the high risk part. So we look at some of the brightest members, and this is actually the Phoenix stream. So it's called Phoenix Camp because that's the one of the stars that we observed in Phoenix, and we just labeled it. So this is the most metal pore stream that's in our sample. But we find interesting is one of the stars here. This is called Phoenix Camp, that star in the uh, temperature log G's panel. Uh, you can see that uh, if you look at uh, the line around the uh, 6707 or 6708, that's the lithium absorption. So most of our member stars have zero absorption there, but this particular one has a very strong um, lithium absorption line. So this is the first lithium rich giant star that we find in a global cluster. This is very rare. It's like 1% of all the giant stars that we know nowadays. It's very interesting to find it in a, in a stream that was originated from a global cluster system. And I think uh, it's kind of one of the many interesting things that we see we didn't expect it originally, but that's the date what we have. And another work I'm gonna show here is another star in a stream called Indus Indus stream, and uh, it's just a number thirteen star we observed I think in that stream. And uh, this work actually led by Therese Hansen when she was still here, or oh, maybe oh, I, she never worked on this when she was still here. And so this one is interesting because it's a. Uh, it's a it, the thing is, it's a dwarf galaxy stream that's in our sample. And what you're seeing here is the velocity versus the European. So it's one of the, the up process elements. And uh, you might heard if you ever ever pay attention to nuclear synthesis or the abundant star, you might heard of something called the rectangular two dwarf galaxy, which has like 80 to 90 percent of the member stars in that dwarf galaxy to be uh, up process enhanced. And then we also know a few of the classical dwarf galaxy has um, uh, has of this enhanced stars. But uh, here we have this uh, industry, which we observed about a total of eight star with uh, abundances. And one out of these eight star has a very high uh, European abundance. So this is the first highly uh, very neutron capture R process enhanced star that discovered in a dwarf galaxy stream. So it's, it's, a, it's one from very a small sample. So we actually now as expanding this sample, I think we have a total of about 20 member stars because these streams, they are dwarf galaxy, but they're nearby, they are only like 20 kiloparsec compared to all the other classical, classical dwarf here, right? They are out to like a few hundred, a hundred or 150 kiloparsec from us. So we actually can get a good sample of these, uh, process, uh, sorry, a good sample of these bright dwarf galaxy uh, stars that close by and then we can get the individual measurement on the abundance pattern. So, so we are expanding the sample to about 20 stars and trying to understand the abundance for, for this industry. And I also want to see if this is a one unique star. If it's only the only one, then it's possibly that's just some kind of a creative one. But if there's more, then it's interesting to understand why some of them doesn't have the uh, process enhancement and some does have. And this is a very nice match with uh, with our enhancement with all the elements we measured. And I also want to say that we not only did these two uh, stream, we actually followed up seven of them in our first uh, overview paper on this topic. And uh, I think now we have high resolution of about ten stellar stream, and we are actually working on that. Okay, so that's some so far covered the 
S5 stream component and S5 high res component. But I also want to emphasize S5 is more than just a stream survey, although it started with stream, because that's what I want to do. It actually started with the dark energy survey footprint in the tank shape, if you remember I mentioned. We actually expanded to the entire southern sky because we find we just can't do that. We also followed up a lot of uh, bright members to measure the abundances. But we also want to do more than just that because when we use this uh, AT telescope, it has 400 fibers. I realized that with, with photometry from DES or with others from other survey plus for proper motion from Gaia, we only need about 100 fibers per AAT field, but we have 400 fibers. So we should use those. So I started a halo survey and a low surface survey. I will touch a little bit on both of these. So basically it's saying, oh, if this field, we have a hundred targets that will stream, what are we gonna use the other 300 fiber or make 250-ish because some of goes to the sky to do halo. And if we find all the star we want to observe in the Milky Halo, then we can put some of those in the low redshift gaps. So some of the result from the S5 halo survey. So this is pure by accident. I don't think we expected these. I tried to observe all the blue stars because they are rare and uh, we can just fill all the fiber with, we can fill like 20 fibers-ish per field for all, the, uh, for all the blue targets. So we did that, but it turns out to be one of the first science paper we have to roll because it's so important and so surprising. And uh, we triggered all of the writing process because of this discovery. So this is a star that we find in our sample in one of the stream field. And what interesting is we find the star has a line of sight velocity around a thousand kilometer second. And the first reaction when I saw that, well, what would happen is when we had an internal data release, like we sort and uh, look at the, bright, the, the fastest uh, star at like plus minus a thousand, then we find this one. And the first reaction like is that's a junk or that data is wrong or something. But then the spectra looks good, but we still don't believe it. So we got our collaborator to get some telescope time to observe this star with a different, uh, with the same instrument, still get the same result. We say, oh, the instrument may be broken or did something wrong. So we use a different instrument to confirm and still a thousand calm per second. And I was shocked, so that's a real discovery. And then with Gaia information, we can get the distance and the proper motion. So total 3D velocity at 17 kilometers per second. So that's a hypervelocity star that we discovered from, from one of the 40,000 star we observed uh, in the first week. This is the fastest uh, May sequence star ejected from the galaxy center. That's making even interesting because we have the 16 uh, information of the star. We rewind the orbit, it comes from exactly from the center of the galaxy. I mean, high velocity is not a new thing. Uh, people have been MK survey to search for these kind of things. I think they miss this star because it's not an O or B type star, it's an A type star. So there's a lot of these kind of A type star that people didn't really bother to follow up all of them. And we just happened to get this one in our sample. But it's still very interesting because these are all the type of star stars before this S5 HVS1, that's what we call it. No. So all of the high velocity star people believe they're coming from the, the, uh, the super. Uh, massive black hole in the Milky Way center, like eject one of the binary, capture another binary and eject the one of the binary. And, uh, but most of those that has been found so far are between 600 to uh, like 900 kilometers per second. And this one we had was doubled of any of the high, uh, high velocity star. So that's a very surprising thing. And uh, it's either telling us none of these are real high velocity star because there are much larger error bars in most of these in terms of where their, uh, their ejection like location on the plane is. Or maybe there is some kind of intermediate mass black hole in the center that kind of interact with the supermassive black hole. So there is some time and uh, uh, angle dependence on the spectra of the ejection speed of the, of the high velocity star. But anyway, that's a very cool discovery. I totally unexpected, but that's cool to see. And then we also did a few other things. I want to loosely mention it here, although it's not a super, I think we, we are using the data to do some follow-up science that I want to mention to this group. And I think it's important to let people know um, is on, on Milky Way Halo Survey. So one is we get about velocity for like 30,000 star. So we wanted to, we made this plot to show like how good this photometry from the dark energy survey could, could do uh, the photometric velocity, which is, which is not really how awesome S5 is, it's really how awesome dark energy survey is, which is what I'm part of all my degree, all my graduate student. 
So what you're seeing here is a G minus R versus R minus C. So the two broadband in the dark energy survey, color coded with the metallicity from S5. So each color, uh, each being that it's average from for the stars in that group. So it's color coded by metallicity. So I think you might heard of photometric metallicity, especially from U band, because people have been using like Sloan to do these kind of photometric metallicity. People also using kind of narrow band to do that. But the point here I'm trying to say is now we can do this with just GR. Z broadband to get good for the metallicity between low and the minus two, right? And that's actually how we use to do a lot of the selection in all the, all the streams to make it efficient. So we can select metal pool stars just from the photometry. And this is something we can do next year or two when LCST come online. And this is like a, the red end for the metal pool, metal rich separation. On the right panel here, I was showing you G minus R versus I minus C again from the DES broadband photometry. And uh, the color code here you can think of as the, the confirmed blue horizontal branch star. So one type of blue star, but are giant stars and the blue straggler or may sequence star. So it's blue star, but in the in the in the in the dwarf side. So it's giant star versus dwarf. So again, you can use the broadband photometry to separate the two. And this is from the dark energy survey DR1. And I just want to blink these two to show you. This is from DR2. So the, from DR1 to DR2 is pure uh, improvement in the, the DES photometry precision. And that's a lot of work actually built in this, this, not here, but the other lab that across the street, the modeling lab. So how important I want to show you guys is from this, even this is already great, honestly, and then none of the other survey can do that good, but that going, adding all the calibration what we have effort we put in, that's how good you can separate the giant star with the dwarf star in the blue end. And that's another thing that I also trying to tell people how good that LCST eventually can do. So you will be able to get all of the stars, like uh, the, the, the giant, the, the blue stars in the Milky Way to map the structure of the Milky Way. Okay. Can I ask you a quick question? Yes. So it is absolutely true that we built the equipment to allow that calibration, but you're the one who did the applied the calibration measurements and showed that the photometry could be that good. It wouldn't have happened without you. So A, thank you. B, who's going to do that for LSST? Are you going to do that? Uh, so LSST currently using the ES pipeline to do all of those. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so it's you happening. taught them how to do it. That's good. Yeah, but uh, they probably didn't know. They probably didn't know how good this is. So I'm going to the DCAM 10 year uh, conference next okay, to tell them that they can do that. Okay. So I already spent 40 minutes on the intro of my <laughs> overview. I actually just have to show the latest science result. But I hope you. Oh. No, I only talk about the halo, right? I just very quickly about the, the, the lows in last component. So it was not, not my expertise. I don't really work on things that are not resolved, but I feel like oh, we should do this because I have three fibers. So we reached out to the SAGA team, that's how Mama Jihar in Yale is the meeting, and I think Richard Weiss was in Stanford. So we said, let's just put down some spare fiber uh, from low redshift galaxy. I work on dwarf galaxy, and not only in the Milky Way, and maybe. M31, but not on the nearby one. But uh, I think it's important for us to understand the galaxy luminosity function. So let's see if we can do anything. So what we did is with some kind of target selection, we use all the spare fibers after the stream of the halo, we put all of them in the in the in in the low Z sample. So it's low redshift galaxies. We are aiming to find the galaxies below low redshift of 0.02, but if it's below 0.05, it's also fine. So what you are seeing here is the distribution of the spectroscopic redshift, and that's what we got. So these are all the, our high priorities. We did not bad. We got about half of those are uh, below 0.05, and uh, we all. I mean, it's not a big sample, but I think this is almost just equivalent to the size of 60F survey several years or decades ago um, uh, for the for the galaxy below 0.02. So. I haven't really had time to work on any of these data yet, but hopefully we can use these data to do some redshift calibration for the low redshift galaxies. That's, that's something um, still working in progress. Okay, so I now give an overview about our, our re recent work in the past two years or three years. I do want to spend the rest of time, whatever I have, maybe 15 minutes on the, on the latest, uh, paper that I, I published early this year. 
So as I mentioned, our goal is to build a library of a bunch of streams in our new community to answer different questions. But this paper is like the first time study of 12 streams. All of them has no progenitor identified, so we call progenitor free stellar stream, located between 10 to 50 kiloparsec from the galaxy center. And we observed it in those three years. So that's what it's about. So I'm gonna show a few results uh, from, from this work. Any questions before I move on? Okay, so the first question we'll ask is, okay, we have 12 stream here and we have their 60 measurement plus mouth from the S5 stream component. So what we can learn, the first thing we did is, what are the projections? Are they dwarf galaxies or are they globular cluster? So we measure the velocity dispersion of, uh, of these streams from individual stars in, in this stream and also the velocity dispersion. So we conclude that six of them has a very small velocity dispersion and velocity dispersion that they are originally from global cluster, including the Phoenix stream that I mentioned earlier. And then the rest of them are has higher velocity dispersion and velo all velocity dispersion. So they are originally from dwarf galaxies. So that's the first thing we did. And then the next question we're trying to ask is, okay, well, the disrupted dwarf galaxies, so these are all the ones that are from dwarf galaxies. Just to be, be clear, there are some symbols here. The circles are global cluster stream. The axes are dwarf galaxy stream. That's how we like, separate the two. So here you are seeing is the velocity versus the dispersion of the velocity. And again, all these global cluster stream has very low malice dispersion. But for the one that has high malice stream that we think they are dwarf galaxy, we can also use a relationship we may have heard even you work in astrogalactic, the mass malice relation, right? For the a ga galaxy, there is a connection between what's the mean malicity versus the, the stellar mass of the galaxy. All something kind of observer will use luminosity. So we have a kind of corresponding from mean malicity to to luminosity for only for the dwarf galaxies here. So this is what we have for the six dwarf galaxy stream. And so if you look at them, this is the luminosity. So half of them is in the regime of classical dwarf steroidal, and half of them is around this ultra faint dwarf galaxy regime. So really all these streams, if you consider their mean velocity, their stellar mass is around uh, something between the classical dwarf and the ultra faint dwarf in our Milky Way. Okay, the next thing what we look at is this paper from a uh, simulation. So this is run by the fire simulation. What here they are trying to see is their resolution they allow only to see the number of, to see the streams at five times 10 to the five solar mass because smaller uh, progenitors, they won't be able to resolve from their simulation. And from their simulation, they show there's a total of 12 posts here. There is about three to 13 stellar streams with that mass in those five true simulations. So that's what they found. And that's five times to the five solar mass in the MB space is around something like minus 9.5. So again, everything they have in their simulation is beyond, is on the right hand side, right? It's all more massive, so all luminous uh, on this vertical line. If you look at our Milky Way, there's only one stellar stream that we know are in this regime at, at minus 10, luminosity uh, of minus 10 or beyond. That's a Sagittarius tree. But the simulation says there's something between three to 13 of them. So there is some problem here, like what caused the difference here. And the, the result, so there's a follow up, we just submitted last week or two weeks ago by uh, one of the member in, in S5. She actually is gonna visit, I think in three weeks. So. I'm joking this very fast, but I will spend the entire talk on, on details on this and a lot of other results that, that Nora has been doing. So Nora should. So the conclusion is, yeah, although there are about an average of something like eight to 12 streams that predicted, but if you include all the detectability and all of those, you will actually expect only to see about two streams, one to two streams that observed. So that actually matches original thought, well, there's a too big to fill in the stream now, but actually it's not. But if this is really correct, that's a saying that in the next decade, we'll be able to see all of those stellar streams from deeper imaging survey or other spectroscopic survey. So that's something we would hope to be discovered. So that's kind of very cool. 
I'm going to show another result, I guess, but I don't have too much time to cover that. So this analysis we started, we talk about malicity, we talk about the, the progenitor property. The other thing we started is orbit. So here what you are seeing is um, energy on the y-axis versus the angular momentum in z-direction. Um, and that's for all the stream that we follow, so 12 stream here. So uh, if the LZ is negative, that means the, the stream is pro prograde, which means it's orbiting together like in the same direction as the Milky Way disk. If it's uh, positive, then it's retrograde. It means it's, it's orbiting like uh, in the opposite direction of the Milky, uh, Milky Way uh, disk. And the polar means it's orbiting the polar side. So that's what we got. If you look at this, right, it's pretty obvious probably that, oh, you will see that there is a concentration of the prograde orbit stream compared to the retrograde. And this again is from the same simulation from fire that they try to calculate this angle of the, of the plane. Again, this end is prograde, that end is retrograde. And from the simulation, you see there is no preference. It's almost uniform. And so that's another uh, discrepancy between the, between the uh, observation and the simulation. And, and then probably there's another paper that we can uh, work on to understand what's happening. And I also want to elaborate a little bit more on that. So here you are seeing a histogram of the angle. Again, zero is polar, minus one is prograde, plus one is retrograde. If you look at all the dwarf galaxies in our Milky Way, again, it's kind of uh, symmetric. The prograde and retrograde is about the same amount. But if you look at only the massive dwarf galaxies, which is orange one, you also see a favor of prograde versus the retrograde. Which, which matches with the stream actually. So the, the disruptive stream versus the intact, uh, disruptive dwarf galaxy versus the intact dwarf galaxy, right? So they all preference more forward. So that's maybe connect to some info history of the Milky Way that there are more, more things coming in, in the program than retrograde, like the LMC coming in and the SASH coming, they are actually all in the program part. I have to skip uh, most of these and other studies we have made. Uh, I'm happy to show some of those later. And I just jumped to the last few slides. So I think we have had a lot of great results from S5. I also want to let you know that we also try to make the data public as soon as possible. So for the data we observed in 2019 and 20, 2018 and 2019, we made them public last year. In Oh, I didn't have a date not here, yeah, in April, a year, about a year ago. So it doesn't have everything that we have I've shown here, but it has about 11 stellar stream over 300 square degree. You can find in our website. So if you want to use any of those data for other science, especially for halo science, because we don't have time to explore, you're welcome to try to do that. So with all of these, I wanted to also thank all my collaborators, including Jen here sitting here. So these are the people who have been working on this survey in the past three years with me, from writing proposal to observing to reduction to like follow up, all of those and writing papers. I think it won't be success without all the effort from the, the huge team. And um, yeah, if you're interested, feel free to check our website. My last slide here. So I took the opportunity to remove my uh, conclusion, but I want to show this. So, so this is something I usually put in the motivation, but I always try to delete them, but now I put them in my anyhow. So this is a histogram of the cumulative number of streams that discovered as function of year when it's discovered. So the first one is Sagittarius, discovering like my 94-ish. And all of these programs make a bump. And I stopped making this in 2018 because that's when I started the program. That's where I made the plot for my proposal, right? But uh, actually, I don't have seen here, but actually now the number of streams we know is over 100. In, and uh, and uh, today, may I say something? Maybe I say something tomorrow and the number decrease again. The number of streams that we find in, in the Milky Way is really growing super fast. So in, in, in like late 20, 2020s, I started as five, follow up with a four meter loss. It did 12. That's pretty impressive because this is what have the field ones are the one that has such a school follow up in 2018. That's like seven out of 70. Right, so I decided to start as five. At least we get some of those. It's not fitting all of them yet. Also, not all of them are super interesting. I think half of them are definitely interesting that worth it. But then the question is what about the next decade? The LCST will find lots of those simulation predict there should be many more of those. But what will be the next instrument to do that? Hopefully, people will think about that, support that, and so that more exciting science in the decade. 
So that's end of my talk, and I'm happy to answer questions. Or if you are interested in particular thing, either I talked about, I skipped. I'm happy to to follow up on that. Your questions in the room. Please. Did you call on me, Jen? Jen, did you call on me? Yeah, yeah, yes. Oh, yeah, no, Ting, great talk. I mean, this is really interesting stuff. Um, I missed the point, or I would love to hear more about what you think about the 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 angular momentum energy plot and the distribution that you're measuring for the streams compared to the predictions from fire. Um, it, the, the point I kind of took away from that is that the prediction is it should be fairly uniform, but it seems that's not what you're actually finding. And I missed if you had a little comment about that or what your interpretation I, I, is about that. Yeah, very good. I think I forgot to mention, so my understanding, again, I don't have, I probably not have, there are public fire data which are looking into. So this plot is from one simulation, but I believe it's average over like 12 zoom in simulations. So it's possible in each individual one, you still see this kind of non-symmetric or non-equal uniform distribution. But if you average out that you see this. So that's why I think there should be another paper actually to look into this actually, how it varies from one host to another host. But yeah, just based on these, there is a discrepancy here. But I, if I read the paper, understand correctly, this is average over 12 stream. And that may be the, the reason that they wash out the signal of the non symmetry of what we are seeing. But in our Milky Way, in the outer halo, there's definitely the uh, in, in symmetry between the between the prograde versus retrograde of the group in fall of the satellites group in our Milky Way. At least for the massive end. That, that's, that's yeah, that's that's a great that, that's a great answer. I would love to know the answer as well. But that was my next question: is because it looks like they have a lot more streams, which which implies they've done some kind of averaging, and then it kind of makes sense that the orbits would all be random in the simulations that they've averaged over some number of halos, right? So yeah, we really okay, sorry if I interrupted you. I think that was a great answer. Thank you. I want to know the answer too. Yeah. <laughs> You began by saying that um, work might inform the uh, shape of the halo. Have you gotten enough data to get any hints on that? I, I think we have. Actually, I didn't I didn't really put in my slide because it's really a latest result. But if you go check this paper, the second paper here, led by Dennis Oakhurst, graduate student. So uh, what that paper is dedicated on starting how the stream can use to constrain the shape. And I would say the full conclusion is that, um, well, we're still investigating on that and we hope to do this with more than one stream, but if we're doing this with just a particular one stream. And the, the answer is there is some kind of oblate, prolate kind of shape if you fitting the, fitting the, fitting the stream to the, the potential but if you add the Milky Way or the LMC in, and because LMC in fall into the Milky Way, having have, have this reflex motion, actually that can generate this pro pro oblate kind of shape. And then we can answer every so, so it can be a spherical potential of the Milky Way, but they're adding the LMC in that how this kind of merge together can mimic this artifact. So this whole paper discussed about all of these and how we can use stream to disentangle them. And the idea is if we have stream at different distance, at a different angle part of the sky, we'll be able to get the density profile of the Milky Way and LMC together. But that needs a probably larger sample than what we have here. But we're starting doing that now. And this is a, just a simulation work to show, like, to explain this. We actually haven't really fit this. The fit work will probably come out in like less than a month, I think, with often stream. Yeah. Yes, one more quick question. Um, so you, when you were a grad student, just at the end of your time here, you, you worked with the other scientists to do a, a calculation to figure out how many dwarf galaxies. Rubin would find the analysis you at the time would find. Have you done that analysis for streams? Like, how is how is what's Rubin going to do for you? 
So I didn't uh, myself, but uh, in these papers, so I had these two big two fail question, and I asked ins who wanted to do this, and it happened Nora Ship took a position at MIT, become a postdoc, someone who have access to fiber. So she did uh, this joint work between S5 collaboration and FIRE. So in this paper that just submitted like two weeks ago, there is a session on the prediction. This is the last test of the current system. This is the last test of the current system. This is the last test of the current system. Action is required at this time. It's only a test. So yeah, she will talk more about this. I try to we have like one part of her, but she she has she will show you a slide that believe because about predictions and uh, and uh, yeah, she will give she will talk about all of these like three weeks later. Any other questions? All right, let's thank Ting again. Yes.